some years ago when I first started attending these meetings, one of the first people I met was the uh, gentleman from actually the up east, as they call it. Mike Pedritis uh, comes to us by way of Massachusetts and a few other states up that way. But we've never held it against you. As he told us, you know, he got to Texas as quick as he could, so that's good. Mike, as you know, is a former chapter president. He was in the president when I first uh, got to the chapter and has been a great advocate of talking about what we did in the revolution, what we know about the revolution, what we don't know about the revolution, and some of the questions or mysteries of the revolution. He's here this morning to talk to us about one of the mysteries or misconceptions that took place in the Revolutionary War. And that is, quote unquote, what we call the Battle of Bunker Hill. And he tells me there's a different story. So, Mike, it's yours. Thank you. Morning. Morning, Mike. I'm getting the computer warmed up. Uh, I wasn't a POW, but uh, to be a fighter pilot, you had to go through POW training. It was about a three-week course out in Spokane. And two words uh, that the enemy uses to brainwash you and get you on their side, sleep deprivation. When you're walking around as a zombie for over two days without sleep, you, know, you start uh, bending towards their ways. So sleep deprivation. Uh, more of my other book that I wrote, Fighter Pilot Follies. I think we may need to dim the lights just a touch more, if, if we could. Uh, due to technology, the black one didn't work, but uh, Tom came through on the lighter one. Can anybody see that? Sort of. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big screen with a photo on it. Uh, so the short version of Bunker Hill is that Nixon resigned in 74. The British were so upset that they sent ships to uh, conquer Charlestown. All right, so now that I got your attention, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, Bunker Hill. Um, it, I'm sorry for the, the lighting, so is there anybody that cannot see it? Or we got tables up here if you want to come closer. So what happened? Uh, let's talk about Boston, the Boston area. Uh, Bunker Hill, or Breed's Hill, happened on June 17th. Uh, prior to that, on the 18th of April, 75, hardly a man is now alive. We had the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Uh, so this is the monument going up to uh, what's now Bunker Hill in Charlestown. And let's take a look at the, um, at the Boston area. Sometimes it goes too fast and sometimes it goes too slow. Uh, so here's the Boston area. Let me try to point out. So Boston is right here. At that time, it was in a peninsula. This is the Back Bay. Uh, who's from Boston? Who's been up to Boston? All right, a few, maybe half. Uh, the Back Bay has been filled in. So Copley Square, if you're familiar with that area, that's right here in this body of water. Uh, Boston is right here. Charlestown is right here just across. This is the Charles River, uh, which is now or now MIT and Harvard are over in this area. So we have uh, Lexington and Concord uh, up here to the upper left uh, on the screen. And Cambridge is where the Colonials had their headquarters. On the south of Boston is Roxbury, which is not a nice area to travel through by night these days. Uh, so that's uh, also a, an area that the British were concerned about. So what the British did in the short version is they were preparing to launch on the eastern side of Charlestown right here uh, and also send in troops from Roxbury to south through Boston where there was a battery of cannons on the north end where the Old North Church is uh, in this area. Sometimes you can just tap the screen and it works. And So there are three hills. Uh, the, the, where the battle happened is Breed's Hill here. Bunker Hill is to the top left, 
and there's also Molten Hill on Charlestown to the top right. Again, here's the uh, Charles River in this area, and then you have the uh, beachhead where the uh, British uh, landed their ships and their, and their troops. So on June 16th, a day before Bunker Hill, the Colonials got wind that the British were about to start an invasion, if you will, on Cambridge and into Roxbury. And so on the night of the 16th, the day before the battle, they prepared uh, battlements, redoubts, uh, fortified walls, if you will, which were actually shorter than the Alamo in San Antonio, so they really weren't, weren't that tall of a wall. But they started these fortifications on the night of the 16th. Now, Bunker Hill itself was a great trading area and uh, very important for commerce. Uh, you can see here from the advertisement that they are uh, sending ships all the way to San Francisco. So it's a major port area, and the, the British are not keen on letting it fall into colonial hands. Let's talk about some of the major players uh, before we get into the battle itself. Uh, just before the, the monument is a statue of William Prescott. So we have several players here that were involved in the Seven Year War, the French and Indian War, so they're battle hardened. Now, uh, Major General uh, Wes, uh, Prescott was uh, commissioned as a Major General, but he was a doctor in the Freemasons. The Freemason Society was established in England around the year 1717. And uh, Dr. Uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Colonel uh, Prescott. Uh, I'm sorry, I get that mixed up with Dr. Warren. So this is a statue of uh, Prescott. Uh, I'll get into Dr. Warren here in a second. Prescott was a colonel and a battle-hardened uh, soldier involved in the Seven Year War. And he led about 1,700 men in the center of Breed's Hill, which was that uh, hill there to the south. Here's a better statue uh, today, right in front of the monument of uh, Colonel Prescott. Uh, Colonel Prescott was concerned about the, this is really hard to see, I apologize. Uh, he was really concerned about the British possibility of advance. And back in May, he had sent, about a month prior, he had sent this order to General Artemis Ward, who was in charge of the uh, garrison there at Cambridge, that we need better reinforcements at Breed's Hill. So already a month prior, a month after Concord and Lexington battle, uh, but a month prior to Bunker Hill, the Colonials were already worrying about a, a British advance in, on the Breed's Hill in Charlestown. Uh, John Stark, uh, in, in my opinion, he's the hero of the war. John Stark uh, was involved also in the French and Indian War. He manned the line of defenses on the north side of Breed's Hill and uh, withstood all three advances of the British. He ended up uh, dying at an old age uh, in his early 90s, uh, but he was also part of Rogers Rangers. Everybody heard of Rogers Rangers? So uh, a battle-hardened soldier, and uh, I'm sure he earned many Purple Hearts, but uh, he's one of the key players in this war, or this battle also. Here's a statue inside the visitor center at Bunker Hill of uh, Dr. Warren, so it's, uh, this is a fellow I confused earlier, so it's Major General Warren, and during the battle, in a yield to the military expertise of Colonel Prescott, he agreed to fight in the battle as a private. So he threw away his two-star Major General rank, took on the role of private, and fought under uh, Colonel Prescott. Uh, and it's because of uh, Major General Warren's relationship with the Freemasons that I mentioned earlier, that the Freemasons erected the first monument at Bunker Hill, which stood for about uh, until the 1830s, until they built the present day monument. On the British side, we got uh, Major General Clinton, who, uh, who thinks Cornwallis was the, uh, the lead general for the Brits for the, all, of, all of North America. Actually, it's this fellow here. Uh, General Clinton uh, was in charge of the Boston area and later became, uh, in the early 19, uh, 1780s, became in charge of all of North American British forces. Uh, many British attributed the loss of the war to General Clinton, uh, but so Cornwallis was more involved in the southern part 
uh, of the colonies uh, during the Revolutionary War. Uh, but General Clinton is leading the, the Navy ships uh, on the attack on Charlestown. Uh, here's a little bit on here. Again, I apologize for the uh, lack of clarity. But uh, the thing about uh, General Clinton is that he was a member of parliament and also a, a military officer, so he was well regarded. In today's uh, parliament, he would be a lord. He wouldn't be a member of the House of Commons, he'd be a member of the House of the Lords. Uh, so well regarded uh, from the British perspective. Now let's talk about the battle itself. In one of the famous paintings, uh, the fellow in white here is Dr. Warren, or Major General Warren, who again agreed to fight as a private. And uh, he dies early on. Uh, because of his distinguished career, he was commissioned as a major general, but again had no real fighting experience compared to Colonel Prescott or, or Colonel Stark. Uh, so he was one of the first ones to go, but because of his status in society, they made a nice painting about him. Let's talk about the where everybody is. Uh, so on the this is Breeds Hill. Bunker Hill is up in the upper left, and again, Moulton Hill is, is over here. The British had three ships. The Falcon uh, had 12 cannons. It was a sloop. Uh, there's a battery here on the north end of Boston, and then the British had other uh, ships here. And again, they're trying to land reinforcements. Uh, this is a daytime battle. We don't fight at night like the Navy SEALs do today. Uh, so Colonel Stark that I mentioned earlier is up on this line of defenses here with about 400 men. Uh, Breeds Hill here is under Colonel Prescott with about 1,700 men. Uh, there's a redoubt, uh, which is like an earthen berm, if you will. Um, there's a nice redoubt. If you ever go to Valley Forge, they got a really uh, preserved one there. Uh, but there's a redoubt here, and then to the south, uh, they have other uh, defenses with the Colonials. But again, the, the fortifications are not strong. It's not a 100-foot high cliff that they're trying to use as a defense or a wall. Uh, these are more like farm field walls that they're trying to use just to prevent or slow down the advance of the British. Uh, there's a narrow peninsula that goes over towards, from Charlestown over to Cambridge, where the uh, again, there were more American or colonial forces there, and one of the drawbacks of the battle was that the General Artemis Ward, who was in charge of all the uh, colonials in Cambridge, was slow and even uh, didn't uh, have the inclination to send reinforcements across there. Had he done so, he might have left Cambridge exposed. They might have won Bunker Hill, but they may have left Cambridge exposed to the British onslaught, which was coming around from Roxbury uh, more to the south. So these are the line of defenses. Uh, the key takeaway of the battle is that the British advanced not just once, but three times, which is unheard of uh, prior to uh, these type of engagements. The other takeaway is that the colonials persevered in killing more British, then they lost. So they proved that they could fight the world's best army and have, well, if you want to call it a success by numbers, uh, that they could achieve at least good results. So let's get into some detail about the uh, battle. Uh, be before I do that, I want to talk about the face of the soldier. Uh, who has heard of Christmas Attics and the Boston Massacre? So that was in 1770. Uh, Crispus Attucks was a, uh, a black uh, former slave who was killed. And what this article shows here, it's also in the visitor center of Bunker Hill, is that there were many Indians and uh, former slaves, black slaves, who were part of the Continental Army, uh, were, were up in the New England militia at least, who were helping to fight the war. So uh, the, the face was not just Caucasian, it was a mix of folks. These guys were also farmers, uh, and more importantly, they were good hunters. And so the British suffered most of their losses via snipers that were in the trees uh, in Charlestown, uh, on the, just the outskirts of Breed's Hill. Uh, so while the British were setting Charlestown aflame with their cannon fire from the ships, 
the snipers were picking off the officers. Again, it wasn't, if you've seen the Mel Gibson Patriot movie, it wasn't gentlemanly to start shooting officers. But the farmers, they could care less, right? They just see uh, red, the red coats, and they're shooting. So they're not really uh, big on to distinguish who's an officer and who's open for shooting. Abigail Adams, who's Abigail Adams, John, future President John Adams' wife, uh, she wrote a piece about the battle which I can enlarge here, and basically she said, this high ground of Breed's Hill bound the American colonies to the cause of independence. An open field once located here commanded the entire area. On the night of June 16, 1775, two months after the fighting of Lexington and Concord, 1,200 colonial militiamen, militiamen quickly built a small earthen fort. As dawn broke on June 17, the fort stood in clear view of the British Army in Boston. British cannon from the ship and land opened fire, some 2,200, so they had 1,000 more British soldiers than the Colonials did. Some 2,200 British soldiers crossed the Charles River and assaulted the hill. After several bloody attacks, the British troops overran the colonists. The British forces won this ground, but it cost nearly half of their men. Uh, the other key takeaway, uh, and this was a factor throughout the uh, Revolutionary War, is lack of ammunition. So th there were three charges, uh, three attacks, and we'll talk here later that the third attack was mostly British bayonets and colonials throwing rocks and sticks. Uh, they ran out of ammunition. Uh, so we went back to a uh, Stone Age. In uh, this one here, and again, the quality is not the best. So. The Falcon ship that the British command is over here, and it's just laying down cannon fire. Uh, Colonel Stark's up at this line of defense. There's Colonel Prescott's uh, down here. Uh, 400 men up north, seven, uh, 700 men here uh, with Colonel Prescott. And they're, they're taking the brunt of the attack on the north side. There's, again, another uh, earthen redoubt, if you will, over here on the south with the Colonials. Uh, and it's also a at Copps Hill on the north end of Boston by the Old North Church, they're also firing cannons across the Charles River uh, into here. So Charlestown is right here. If anybody's visited the Constitution, uh, then it's, it's in this area here. And that's set ablaze. Uh, it's on fire. So that was the first attack. And again, that was just after dawn. The uh, Colonials fired back with cannon and to try to stop the British ships from landing reinforcements on the shore because they didn't have that many there to begin with. Uh, here's what they have to say inside the uh, visitor center. Uh, the hill uh, teamed with troops. The attack uh, to the artificial, uh, I'm sorry, to the untrained eyes, the British in the morning's light on June 17th revealed to the Patriot troops and fortifications. Exhausted from building the defenses all night, the Patriot soldiers had little or no food or water, scant ammunition, and faced a brutally hot day. The British ships began firing cannons, although most cannonballs fell short. The dramatic noise of the nearly day-long bombardment intimidated the inexperienced troops, as did the first grim fatality, the beheading of Private Asa Bullard by a cannonball. As barges of British forces landed on the Charlestown Peninsula, the Patriots continued to fortify their defenses, especially at their exposed left flank. By mid-afternoon, the Patriot forces had secured positions and occupied the town as residents had withdrawn. The deployed British troops, including the Marines and artillery, numbered 2,500. Abigail Adams had said 2,200 earlier. They confronted the Patriot forces uh, of about 3,500 only a portion of these Patriot troops fought in the front lines. Others comprised reserves or they held back on the actual Bunker Hill, partly due to the widespread confusion among the Patriots enlisted in officers. And then the article continues, balls flew like hailstones and cannons roared like thunder. The British began their assault on the hill and on the Mystic River Beach, that's on the south side of Charlestown, with full packs and oppressive heat, they advanced across the irregular terrain unsuited to the typical British tactics of volley firing and frontal assault. In the first two British assaults, the Patriots shooting from cover killed and wounded scores of British soldiers and deliberately fired upon many officers to create chaos. 
ordered not to shoot until they could see the whites of their eyes, as legend has it. The rebels fired at close range, tearing gaps in the British ranks and driving back the left, those left standing. Prior to the first assault, snipers had been positioned in the town of Charlestown, and they fired upon the British forces. In response, the British set fire to the town. From the rooftops of Boston and nearby towns, patriots, loyalists, and British forces watched Charlestown burn to the ground. And here's an artist rendition, uh, Charlestown to the uh, right side of the screen, and Boston to the left, with the Charles River there in the middle. So the second attack, I'm not sure if you can see the arrows, but they did a major assault where Colonel Prescott had on the wall here, and they were forced to retreat to the uh, redoubt. Uh, and again, the British ships, they had snuck one around the side here. So this is the Mystic River Beach. Uh, if you walk from the, uh, across the Charles River, take this causeway, it's now a bridge, you can go over to MIT, which didn't exist back then. Uh, and again, you have the North Battery here from uh, the, uh, near the Old North Church in Boston, uh, firing also into Charlestown. So the, the brunt of the attack was more on the middle part of Breed's Hill. Again, Bunker Hill is to the top left. And so th there were troops there were at Bunker Hill that either for lack of command or uh, fear that if they committed the troops at Bunker Hill, they would now ha not have any protection on the peninsula to uh, uh, Cambridge, where the colonial headquarters were, they kept a lot of troops at Bunker Hill and didn't use them for the uh, fighting going on at Breed's Hill. The uh, story continues, despite the extraordinary losses, the disciplined British troops regrouped after the retreats and advanced a third time, which was uncommon as far as tactics go in, in those days. At this point, the Patriot ammunition was very low, with many soldiers resorting to hurling rocks and firing nails as ammunition at the end. Colonel Prescott later said that with enough ammunition for one more round, the Patriots might have prevailed. The British carried and used bayonets. The Colonials did not. When the British finally breached the defenses, vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting using the bayonets was favored by the British, and the Patriots were forced to retreat. Amid the chaos, the Patriots continued fighting and managed to remove most of the wounded from the field. And here's an artist's rendition of the British advancing, uh, again wearing the red coats. So the final attack on Breed's Hill, and, and just to give a bit on elevation, so Bunker Hill is the tallest one on the upper left. It's uh, 110 feet above sea level. Breed's Hill is 62 feet above sea level, and Moulton's Hill on the upper right is uh, just 35 feet above sea level. So the, the main attack here, the British had landed reinforcements from the ships at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the beaches here, and they advanced uh, up to Breed's Hill. And then they had a small one that went around north of Moulton's Hill and attacked Colonel Stark's defenses uh, there to the north uh, of Breed's Hill. But because of the main attack here, the British, uh, the Colonials were forced to flee towards Bunker Hill. And again, what they didn't want is the British to capture the road at the top left uh, going towards Cambridge and their headquarters. And that's where General uh, Artemis Ward uh, was. Now Artemis Ward, just to read about him, uh, he was a Farmer, politician, and volunteer soldier. He directed military operations for the Battle of Bunker Hill, but he was at Cambridge, so he was a behind-the-lines general uh, instead of being at the front. He was more of a uh, Omar Bradley rather than a, a, a General Patton, so to speak. Following the fighting at Lexington Concord, Ward was given command of the militia from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. During the fighting on June 17th, fearing for the safety of Cambridge and for his forces, Ward was slow to commit his soldiers and released regiments piecemeal by piecemeal to the battle. Subsequently, Ward regained command of the Patriot forces until the arrival of General George Washington, who were thereafter commanded. Uh, but so some point the finger at General Ward for uh, delaying uh, sending in reinforcements. Uh, then it was a catch-22. If he let too many soldiers go, then they may have left Cambridge undefended. The other player here is General Israel Putnam, 
who helped lead the retreat so that not all the colonials died in the uh, Battle of Bunker Hill. So Brigadier General Israel Putnam of the Connecticut Militia, uh, ironically, uh, since I still fly for a living, Putnam is a prominent uh, waypoint to fly over on your arrival into Boston. It's at the northern, uh, on the Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts border, so they named it after him. Uh, he was a legendary woodsman and fighter, arrived as a key officer uh, during the battle. He was an experienced soldier named Old Putt, and he was impetuous in nature and was among the officers who urged aggressive action against the British. And again, he led the uh, retreat uh, back to Cambridge. Here's the uh, current, or the flag, so it's a blue background, uh, red cross, and an evergreen tree, which are prominent in New England. And I think we, one of us carried that at the uh, Providence School uh, for our uh, April meeting. Uh, there's a stone, a memorial, outside of the, the Bunker Hill mem uh, Memorial, and it reads, uh, Massachusetts Gate. Colonel William Prescott of Massachusetts led the colonial forces here on Breed's Hill. His commanding figure and strong will inspired the farmer soldiers to the greatness of the day. Dr. Joseph Warren, commissioned as a major general, elected to serve Prescott as a private in the battle. Dr. Warren, an early leader of the revolution, was killed in the battlefield in the waning moments of the conflict. So the battle was celebrated by parades uh, after the Revolutionary War was over on an almost annual basis, but not, but it's sporadic. And it wasn't until the 1830s that uh, Daniel Webster and some other congressmen in the area, Daniel Webster being from New Hampshire, uh, helped get funds and start building what's now uh, today's Bunker Hill Monument. Uh, and again, it was before the, uh, the Washington Monument was built, but a, a summer design. It's actually a feat of engineering uh, for those days because of the uh, pulleys and technology that was needed to keep the column vertical and, and not leaning. Uh, so it started in 1830, uh, almost fully developed in 1837, and, and finally complete with a nice parade and opening ceremony in, in the year 1843. Benjamin Franklin had a good quote about this battle as it was really the first military battle in the Revolutionary War. And uh, Benjamin Franklin said, the British Army was one of the most powerful military forces of the day. Their leaders were career officers. The troops were regularly trained and were well equipped. Yet the enlisted ranks were often filled with soldiers recruited against their will. Poor and unemployed men sometimes taken right from jail. Uh, John Waller, who was the first lieutenant in the British Army wrote, nothing could be more shocking than the carnage that followed the storming of this work. We tumbled over the dead to get at the living. Nathaniel Green, who was a Brigadier General for the Colonials in Rhode Island, said after the Battle of Bunker Hill that I wish we could sell them another hill at the same price, meaning with the heavy British losses, if we could do that again, the war might have been over quicker. And my daughter thought the tower was out of whack, so she decided to put her hand up and uh, straighten it out a bit, much like the folks do at the Tower of Pisa. <laughs> Outside of the park, there's a plaque that says, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. So who's heard of that expression? So that's, that's very common. It came out of Bunker Hill, and it was attributed towards uh, Colonel Prescott. Uh, and the, the plaque reads, the Battle of Bunker Hill fought here on Breed's Hill, June 17, 1775, was the first major military confrontation of the Revolutionary War. Although the British won the battle at a terrible cost, it was a great moral victory for the Patriots who paved the way that they could and would stand up against the British regulars. The monument is made of Quincy granite. Quincy is a, a suburb of Boston to the south. Uh, between 1825 and 1843, uh, granite was uh, brought from Quincy up to uh, Charlestown, where it stands today as a memorial to the courage, purpose, and sacrifice of those patriots who in 1775 made actions here and rallied the colonials and prompted General George Washington to declare 
The liberties of our country are safe. Any questions? Yes, sir. I'm curious, how, how much longer after the Battle of Reed Hill was it that Washington bombarded the harbor of ships and they, did, they disappeared from Massachusetts for the rest of the war? I think Washington arrived in the fall. Is, is, is anybody clear on, on the timeline? The answer, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. So I, I think it was several, a few more months went by till the fall when Washington arrived, uh, but it wasn't immediate. But that's true. The, the ships, yeah. So the Battle of New England was basically forfeited to because I think they, the British ships went down to New York as New York is the next front. That's exactly uh, where they went. Yeah, and uh, that's an interesting story too. Topic for another time. Yeah. So the bottom line in, uh, people ask, why is it not called the Battle of Breeds Hill? And it's just because Bunker Hill was the tallest hill in Charlestown. The Breeds Hill is uh, about half the height above sea level as Bunker Hill. And, and the mystery is, if you go to see it today, which hill is the monument on? Je, je ne sais pas. In French, I don't know. <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah. is it on Bunker Hill or is it on Breeds Hill where they erected the monument? It, to me, it's on Bunker Hill, yeah, because that is the tallest uh, peak there in, on, on Charlestown. Yeah. Now, very good. Thank you for your time. Oh, yes, sir, Terry. You went over it quickly, but a lot of people don't recognize one of the reasons George Washington survived is in fact the British war zone, and that's where the British took over the British. Correct. So they 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 honored the rules of war and. Uh, well, we didn't we didn't read that book quite yet. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for your time. Well, Mike, thank you. It's been some long time coming because I know you have a number of talks to make. I'm sure we'll see you again. But this is exactly what we're looking for: is participation from our own membership contributions about the Revolutionary War, and I thank you for that. For that, obviously, a couple customs. You've given them before. I'm going to give this to you as a certificate of appreciation for what you did this morning. Thank you, sir. And... Yeah, well, okay. Do it all at once. And I did have the bell. <laughs> We've done this for years, and we're going to do it again. Perfect. I love Very the good. music, too. Thank you. Thank you again, my friend. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Remember, no shade November.